cold? Are we cold? I hope when Blair said, what are we grateful for? You said hair. This morning, I seriously, I could preach with a hoodie on today because this is, this is man's way of putting hair back on a bald person. It, it works and it's cold, but it's good to be here. I won't preach with a hoodie on. Are we good? Church, come on, convinced. Are we good this morning? Are we good? I hope so. Oh, I'm so excited. As a pastor, we get pumped when we start a new series. It's sort of one of those things, I can't explain it, but as a pastor, you go, yes, there's a new series. There's something new and something fresh that God wants to show, I believe, show us and also grow us. In fact, this series, Rod's given it away. He's sort of put the, put the little, uh, you know, pop the, the cork, so to speak, on what we're doing. But I believe this series is going to challenge you to the core. It's going to grow your faith if you choose to lean into it. And you will continue to see the world differently. That's what I believe. The Sermon on the Mount is where we're going. Right, if you want to put that there, great, sorry, there, good. Sermon on the Mount is where we're going. It is a great series. Um, It sort of will go over four and a half months. We're going to journey right up to nearly Christmas with this one. This Sermon on the Mount goes over three chapters, Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7. And it's kind of a bizarre title I was thinking about. It's like the Sermon on a Hill. It's kind of effectively what it says. It's the Sermon on a Hill. It doesn't really tell you about what it is, the three chapters. Maybe if I was to, to, to change the title, I would say it's the Sermon about the Kingdom of God. It's the sermon on how Jesus instructs you and I, if you are a follower of Jesus, to live out your life. At the end of Matthew 7, right at the end, after he's preached everything, after he's poured out his heart to the crowds, he says this. He doesn't say, actually, the crowds in, in, in Matthew 7, 28 says, When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. Because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Here's my prayer, church. My prayer is that at the end of this series, we are also amazed and astonished. And like I said, challenged to the core on how Jesus calls a follower of him to live. That's my prayer. Because I believe if we get this right, the world will see a different you. The world will see a different me. The world will see a different church. And they'll say, wow, why do you do the things that you do? That doesn't make sense. There is so much that we're going to unpack in this series. And my prayer is that the Holy Spirit, without you even knowing, has been preparing your heart for this series. One quote that I read about this series says this. It says, the Sermon on the Mount is the most complete description anywhere in the New Testament of the Christian counterculture. Here is a Christian value system, ethical standard, religious devotion, attitude to money, ambition, lifestyle, and network of relationship, all of which are the total opposite, church, of the non-Christian world. This sermon presents life in the kingdom of God, a fully human life indeed, but lived under the divine rule. You see, this sermon that Jesus gave wasn't just some thoughts or some random ideas that he said to a bunch of people on a hill. These are the words that Jesus said, if you follow the works and the words and the ways of me, this is how I want you to live. So friends, if you brought the Bible this morning, flick it open to Matthew 5. If you didn't bring the Bible, if you're not in the habit of bringing a Bible to church, that's cool. You have four months to change that habit. Bring a Bible to church. Walk in with the Word, the hard copy, the paper version, the thin paper. Or if you don't have the paper version, come to see me, we'll give you one. Or download the Bible. There's like a million Bible apps that you can download. Download one, start highlighting, start writing notes, because the Spirit will speak to you through these words. I'm praying that I'm speaking to you through God this morning and other preachers that are up here for the series, but he just, he just downloads straight to you as well. It's great. You've got to be ready for that. Bring the word. If you don't have the word, download it now on your phone. 
Here we go, Matthew 5, let's flick it open. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to a mountainside and sat down. Let me just pause there for a moment. This is really, really important. When Jesus saw the crowds, you see, at this time, Jesus was a big deal. He was healing, he was feeding, he was going around from town to town. People were seeing and hearing and wanting to see and hear who Jesus was. In fact, there was a few crowds. There was one crowd that just wanted the free lunch from Jesus. There was another crowd that wanted to be healed by Jesus because they're seeing and hearing all these healings. So they were following Jesus for a healing. And there was another bunch of people in the crowd that were his disciples. Now, we think disciples was 12, but there was lots of people following Jesus around claimed to be his disciple, who were just leaning into his teaching. We know that a disciple is a learner of Jesus. So if we go back to Matthew 4, the very last verse in Matthew 4, it says this, large crowds from Galilee, from the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Let me put a visual thing, because I'm a visual guy. Ryan, if you could put that next slide up with the map, that'd be great. So, we're talking the Decapolis. We're talking uh, down here in Jerusalem. We're talking up here around the Sea of Galilee, which is where Jesus parks himself to preach this sermon. So, this whole entire region, which is enormous, are hearing who Jesus is. And he's got all these people following him. So, think about how many people that is. That's a large catchment that Jesus has of followers all around here. So, back to that slide again, Ryan. It says, the crowds, it says, now uh, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. See, here's a cool thing back in the time. We've lost it today. But if you were a rabbi who was teaching with authority, you would sit down, you'd take a seat, and everyone around him would be standing. Uh-huh. You know where I'm going with this? Let's give this a go, church. Just jump to your feet for a moment. Come on, up we get. Up we get. Here we go. So the way he would do it, he would just preach this sermon, and you would be standing the whole time. And he was just sitting back. Now, this wasn't uh, unusual. Matthew, I think, 14. Let me just check this one out. Matthew 13. Sorry, I'm going to sit back down. Matthew 13. Matthew 13, we read Jesus sitting down in a boat teaching the crowds. In Luke chapter 4, he's in Nazareth. He's just read the scrolls. And then in Luke chapter 4, it says he sat down and began to teach because he was bringing authority. He was bringing teaching. If a rabbi was just having a conversation with Dean, if I'm just having a conversation with Dean, I'd sit, don't sit down, church. I'd stand and just talk to Dean one on one because it's a casual conversation. How's it? Hey, Paul, up you get, up you get. Come on, stand up. I saw that. So he would sit down and the crowds would actually stand and listen to this whole sermon. But let's remain standing, not for the whole sermon, just for this next part, church, as we read through the first part of Matthew 5. It says, it says this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Take a seat, church. If I read through those Beatitudes, the most obvious word that stands out to me is this word blessed. And if you know what the word blessed means, you'll know it means uh, happy. Blessed is the person. I don't walk around saying, oh, what a blessed loaf of sourdough I've got. I'm so blessed. You know, I could, but probably more church people would understand that saying. But if we sort of stretch that word a bit more and say, what does the word blessed mean? Does it just mean happy? 
It's this Greek word, makarios word, which means happy or fortunate, inward happiness, this satisfaction of the soul. Here's the interesting thing, church. By a worldly standard, what I just read then, those nine verses, the world would say, what are you talking about? There is not this inward satisfaction of the soul for those who are persecuted, for those who are poor in spirit. Are you saying blessed if I'm, if I'm mourning? Are you saying that I'm blessed if I'm persecuted? The world would say, hang on a second, if I had a chance to write these Beatitudes, I might write a little bit different. Might say, blessed is the person who is financially wealthy. Blessed is the person who has a high standing, high paying job. Who's in, blessed is the person who has power. Blessed is someone who is tanned. I didn't get that one. I'm as pink as anything. The world writes so different to the way Jesus writes. This is countercultural living at its best. And when Jesus says these things, and I'm so thankful that Matthew records them, it challenges me to the core. Verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The one thing I want you to see with these Beatitudes this morning is that they flow. They're sequenced. One flows into the other. And Jesus starts by saying, blessed is the person who is poor in spirit. Blessed is the person who comes with this humility, this heart of repentance. And the word repentance is just this complete change of mind. I come to you, Jesus, with a repentant heart. This person who he says, blessed is this person, they are absolutely spiritually bankrupt. They know they're a sinner in need of a saviour. They come with this repentant, this poor spirit. Jesus says they will find joy, blessed. They'll find happiness in their soul when they carry a humble, when they carry an in need, broken before God spirit. Not a proud spirit, but this Wowzers, that's a Greek wowzers, I am a wretch. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saves a wretch, a sinner, a broken hearted person like me. Jesus starts here by saying it actually starts with you dropping to your knees and realizing you are very, very small and God's very, very big, but God's very, very big lifts you up to be very, very big with him. Standing right beside him, you are a child. The masterpiece, it says in Ephesians chapter 2. He wants you to know that. He made you, created you the way you are, with hair or without hair, tanned or not tanned. He loves you unconditionally. But he wants us to realize that we are poor in spirit. In fact, Spurgeon says this, everyone can start here. It is at first blessed are the pure or the holy or the spiritual or the wonderful Everyone can be poor in spirit. Not what I have, but what I have not is the first point of contact between my soul and God. How good is that, church? So Jesus says, blessed is the poor in spirit. And then he says, when you get that, blessed are those who mourn. He says, for they will be comforted. In other words, when you realise that you're a sinner in need of a saviour, that if left to my own device, I would corrupt the world. Left in the hands of God, I become his mouthpiece, his instrument, his heartbeat to a world that so desperately needs him. He goes, blessed are those who are mourned who realise, who understand that they're a sinner in need of a saviour. Church, does this make sense? Here's the amazing part. That God, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, he forgives. He doesn't say, oh, hang on a second, first you've got to do this and do this and do this and do this and look like this and you've got to memorise these verses and you've got to, he doesn't do that. He goes, no, 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 no. Welcome home. Like, Peter, 
We need another seat at the table. Someone's just joining. Oh, another one's just joining. We need another seat at the table. The table is, there's more room. Around his banquet table. Blessed are those who mourn, who realize they're a sinner, who, who have a humble posture before God. In fact, there's a, there's a story, I love it, a parable that Jesus says in Luke 17. In Luke 17, there's two people. You've got a Pharisee, the righteous, and you've got a tax collector. And Jesus uses these two, pairs them up together to tell a parable. He says this. He says, two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and he prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. <laughs> he goes, I fast twice a day, uh, twice a week, sorry, and I give a tenth of all that I get. This proud, this stinking heart, right? And Jesus goes, hang on, but the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his chest and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He goes, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves, they'll be exalted. They'll be lifted up. They're the ones that sit at the table, not the proud, not the ones that think they've got it together, they've, they, they've figured it out. It's those that see that they are poor in spirit and that they mourn. And when we get those two, blessed is the person who mourns for they will be comforted. Jesus then hits the next one up and he says, blessed are those who are meek for they will inherit the earth. Now, this word meek's an interesting word. In fact, the word meek, uh, you, there's actually not a word to describe the word meek in our language. You can't actually get a, like a one word that means meek. The, the word meek would mean this indifferent, powerful personality, properly controlled and of humility. That's kind of what it sums up. To make it even easy to understand, it doesn't mean weak. Meek rhymes with weak, has nothing to do with it. In fact, weak's out that door and meek's out that door. They're so far apart from each other. The word meek would mean power under control, another way to say it. Think about this horse or this stallion, right? This strong creature that has a lot of power, right? It could easily overpower a human being. Horses are crazy strong. But if the owner just puts the bit and bridle part in the horse's mouth, he's actually got control over that horse and can lead that horse anywhere the owner wants to take that powerful creature. Now, Jesus is saying here, okay, if you recognize that you are poor in spirit and that you mourn, now you come to me with a meek spirit. Now you've asked me to come into your life. Now you've asked me to take over control of your life. You've handed your life to me. You are obedient to me. Therefore, now my spirit will be in control of you. It says in Proverbs that the words, our tongue has the power to give life or death. That your life is so powerful. You can take life away from someone or give life to someone. That's what you're capable of doing. And Jesus says, hey, blessed are the meek of those who understand that they are a powerful person, but when they submit and when they have this poor in heart spirit, they come like this to Jesus on their knees. And they say, not my will, but yours be done. That I'm a powerful person, but in your control. In fact, now your power flows through me. Does that make sense, church? This power under control type of person. I want to be that person. I want to be the person that the Holy Spirit is working so powerfully through me that I can do whatever he calls me to do without faulting or budging. And church, sometimes I'm terrible at that. Sometimes I doubt. I go, you're kidding, God. That's not going to happen. How is that going to work? I've done the sums and that doesn't add up. And he says, not in your power, but it's through me that things are going to get done. And then I go from this posture, from like that, that, I've got to hang on so tight. You know, I can't let go. I'm just going to hang because if I let go, God, I'm not sure what's going to happen. 
And I've said this to you a couple of weeks ago, church. He's gone Ellsmore. Come on. Just let it go. And I turn my hands up. I go, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. You've got so much in store for this church. You've got so much in store for Beachside and this community. Seriously, this community has no idea what's going to happen in the future through Beachside. God is going to do some incredible things through this church. And I'm seriously, if you could jump inside me, you'd see there's like little kids doing backflips. Woo! Like so excited. So I am pumped like a little kid in a candy shop. I'm so excited at what God is going to do through this church. But there's a part of me that does this, that wants to white knuckle and hang on and go, oh, I'm still in control, God, because I don't know how you're going to do it. Because if I do this and do this, he goes, well, shh, Ellsmore, shut up. He didn't really say like that, but you go, shh. He goes, turn your hands upwards, mate. Just sit with me. Be with me. Enjoy my presence. Be meek. Have a meek spirit about you. And I go, ah, yeah, that's right. I'm poor in spirit. I'm broken before you, Lord. I need you. That poor in spirit, that meek heart. He says, when you've got that, when you understand that you are a powerful, your power under control type of person with the Holy Spirit, he goes, then blessed. He goes, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Another version says this, blessed, joyful, nourished by God's goodness are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those who actively seek right standing with God for they will be completely satisfied. Now, I don't know about your house, what it looks like on a school afternoon, but for our house on a school afternoon, we have three hungry bambinos running through the door. And they don't go, hey, how you doing, Dad? How you doing, Mum? They head straight to the fridge or straight to the pantry, and they're like, I just got to get me some food. Just got to snack on some food because I'm hungry. The problem is this. The problem is this, Riley. No, I'm not picking. The problem is this <laughs> that when we snack on food, it does not sustain us. We think it does. We think maybe a little cake or a biscuit or a packet of chips or, or the healthier version, an apple or a mandarin. We might think that that's going to hold me out. I'm going to be satisfied. It's a very short time that satisfaction is met. But what's coming their way at night? They don't know there's some white wine chicken coming with some rice and that's going to hold them over for like till the next morning. That's going to satisfy what they really need. Jesus is saying here, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Who don't just snack. Snacking is like, like you don't get filled up from snacking. <laughs> Go on, Tim. Snacking is like a little part of your soul being filled up, sitting at his banqueting table, saying, Lord, my week is planned, but hang on a second, where do you fit into my day? Have I blocked out just five minutes to snack? Maybe it's that end of the day, I'm lying in bed, my eyes are half closed, I better read the Bible. I say it's not how much you're getting into the Bible, it's how much the Bible is getting into you. Blessed are those who hunger and who thirst for righteousness, who knows that there is more coming your way. Who knows if I give God more, he's going to give me more. He's going to load me up with more to get through the day, to get through the week, to get through the month that has probably been really hard for some of us around here today. He's like, you can't do it on your own. You're going to run out. You're going to get hungry. Stop snacking on my words. Start eating. My, start sitting in my words. Spend time in my word. Here's a question for us, a rhetorical. How do you go with that? Rewind last week. How did you go with that? Was there this hunger and this thirst for righteousness? You just want to sit. The phone rang and you just ignored it. Uh-uh. Me and God, you can wait. How'd you go with that? The good thing is this. The good thing that Jesus doesn't heap shame and guilt on you. 
He says, come with me, get away with me. He goes, you, I'll, you will find a real rest. He says, I won't load anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Learn to walk the unforced rhythms of grace. Just come away with me. Sit with me. So the question moving forward into this week, what needs to change or adjust to sit with God? I'll even say it a bit like this, different way. I'll say, you need to steal time off this world to sit with God. Because this world will say, you're too busy. This world says, there's too much to do. I'm an important person. I've got important things to do. I don't have time, God, right now. Steal time off this world. Say, you know what? I should be doing this, but I'm going to sit with you, Lord. I usually get up at 7 a.m. I'm getting up at 6 a.m. with a hoodie on because it's two degrees. I'm sitting with you, God, with a warm cup of coffee, whatever you drink. And spend time back. Start, start shifting things around. Start hunger and thirsting for the things that God desires for you to have, the good stuff. Not the packet of chips, the good stuff, the healthy stuff, the stuff that's going to grow and nourish you. This person who hungers and thirsts for righteousness, they long to have this righteous, this right with God nature. They long to be, we heard this word last week, sanctified or to be, to be made holy before God. This person longs to continue in God's righteousness and they long to see this righteousness promoted in this world. Person who hunger and thirst for righteousness just doesn't stop here. We don't stop at us. We know that when we receive God's love and power and mercy and grace, we're called then to hand it over to show and tell someone else about God's power and love and mercy and grace. The next part of the, of the Beatitudes is blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed is the person who understands that they are broken, that their sin is in need of a saviour, that understands that they're meek and sit with me and, and, and get fed through me and my word and my spirit. Blessed then is the person who is merciful, for they, for they will be shown mercy. How does the world go with showing mercy to one another? It's not that good. The world doesn't do a very good job at all about showing mercy. The church, counterculture, should be incredible at showing mercy because we have been shown mercy. Because we've understood that God's given us mercy and grace and love, therefore we hand it out. And we give mercy to others and we show love to those who need it. Your neighbour, the person across the road, the person that you sit with across the desk at work, or the person that you cut their hair for if they have hair, at the hairdresser, you want to show them mercy and be merciful to those who don't have hair, who can't sit at the hairdresser. Blessed are those who are pure in heart, for they will see God. This pure in heart is an interesting one. The pure in heart, I actually think, is where our will, our desire, our emotion, even our thinking comes from. We've been given an incredible mind, but I think our heart often controls our thinking. It's where the desire happens in us. And so Jesus is saying, hang on, blessed are those who are pure in heart, who understand that they need me in every part of their life and then they will see God. They will see him work. They will see him uh, go or be in and through all the events that happen in your day and in your week. In fact, the, uh, the, the Solomon writes in Proverbs 23, he says, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. King David writes in Psalm 24, he goes, Who may ascend to the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who does not trust in an idol or swear by false gods. You see, when we have a pure heart before God, we're saying we have a sincere heart before God. 
We want to only have him come in and through our thinking, through our hearts, through our soul, our mind, our actions reflect who God is. Again, how do we go with that? We live in a world that doesn't accept God. We have to be, church, on our knees. Lord, give me your heart today. Give me that pure heart today. Give me that heart that leans in when I want to walk away. Give me that heart that blocks time out for you rather than putting other things above me. Give me that pure heart because I want to see you. I want to see you. He says, when you've got the blessed, when you've got the pure heart, that motive of letting God work in and through and all around your day, he goes, blessed. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. There's two parts, I believe, to this. Blessed are the peacemakers. Firstly, we need to start with ourselves. Are we right before God? Have I accepted Jesus in my heart and made peace with him? Because remember, Jesus is sitting while his disciples and people are standing listening to him, effectively teaching his disciples, teaching people what the kingdom of God looks like. So the first part is, are you right with Jesus? Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? If you haven't today, boom, come on. We want to pray for you. Have Jesus come into the center of your soul and make peace with him and start to enjoy the beautiful banquet table he has for you. And when we've got that right, we then go make peace with others. Peace with those people around us. Is this easy to do, church? Oh, man, I find it so, come on, I find it so hard to do at times. When I look at someone and they do something to me, they cut me, they cut me off and I've caught the red light and they've got the green light. And I've got to now sit at the red light for 15 minutes. And I'm like, oh, really? I mean, that's nothing, right? But it gets way worse than that. It is hard to do. That's little. That's a tiny thing that the, end of the world just tries to chip into me a little bit. Seriously, like I'm being honest here. I find driving super frustrating, don't I, huh? It's one of those... You know, Lord, give me patience today on the road. It's he's just working through me. Lord, I'm pe- make me peacemaker, make me peacemaker. We've got to make peace with those around us. More than that, it's more than that, guys. A peacemaker is realizing that somebody, my neighbor, maybe your neighbor, maybe someone across the road does not know who Jesus is. And I fear and I worry. Like, not a... A bad worry, but this this righteous worrying of where they're going. Of how they're trying to live life on their own without understanding that God is right with them. That he wants to carry their problems. He wants to help them through the trials and the speed humps that are in their life. I want them to find the peace that I have found. Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus says. They will be called children of God. Later on in Matthew chapter 5, in verse 43, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you that they may be children of your heavenly Father. Countercultural living. John 14, Jesus says, peace I leave you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, he says, and don't be afraid. You see, people, church, people who live like this, Jesus says, will be called children of God. I like the thought of, as a child, you want to sit with your parents and be at complete peace, that they've got you, that they're looking after you, that my children tonight don't have to worry about where dinner's coming from, that I've got them, that we've got them, that we pray for them, that we lift them up, that we encourage them when they're feeling down, we spur them on to do the good things at school and maybe to try a little bit harder this term. We spur them on. 
We encourage them that they're doing a great job. We love you, kids. We love you. But I think about that as my father in heaven. And I go, well, if I'm just this earthly father that, that is trying his hardest to love on his kids, my God in heaven is an incredible father who is perfect and holy and knows all things. Then I can sit with him and be called a child of his and be at peace. That I'm in his will, that you're in his will, that he wants to work in and through you and to have you become what God's made you to be. That's his heart. He wants us to be peace makers to not let the world chip away at us i'll be praying another sorry prayer after this to god for letting the world get into me too much again this week just that i'd, I'd lost that peace sometimes i was unpeaceful is that a word unpeaceful sure it is here we go this is the biggest one i reckon when we do this when we start putting these things in place the beatitudes Jesus lands with a drop mic to, his, to, his, to, the, to the disciples. He says, you'll get noticed. You'll be noticed that you're acting differently, that you're treating the world differently, that you're doing something the world says you shouldn't be doing. Jesus says this, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, when persecute you. And falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. He says, rejoice and be glad. Why? Because great is your reward in heaven. Great is your reward in heaven. You see, when you live, when we start to live, the way Jesus starts to describe in Matthew chapter 5, you're going to be noticed. You're going to prick the ears up of the world, of the people around you. And there's a good chance, actually, there's a very good chance that they might not like what you promote. They might not like the value system you've chosen to come under. Jesus says, blessed are you not if people insult you, when people insult you. I remember maybe 15, 20 years ago, I was down in DY in Sydney, sitting down on a park bench on a Sunday morning with my Bible open, getting prepared to preach in church that morning. The sun was rising. I had a copy, had little birds tweeting. It was a perfect whales out. It was beautiful morning. Sitting with Jesus. This is awesome. To my left, I had no idea that someone could put four letter words into a sentence so many times. I'm like, wow, like that's, who are they talking to? And then I look and I go, hang on, they're looking at me. Surely, I'm like, look, me? me? And right up in my face, like I could have kissed the dude, he was so close. I'm like, do I know you? And he was like, wow, like you know, I'm trying to dodge the spray that he was giving me. I managed to say, what's going on, mate? He goes, why do you have the Bible out on a table in public? Whew. That was his problem, was the word of God was insulting to him. It took me a couple of minutes to go from here, like, to get him from like 100% wanting to kill me down to about 80% talking to me. And I sat him down. And my preparation that morning went out the window. I ended up talking to him about, hey, what is your story with God? I want to hear it without judgment. Just tell me, what's your story with God? And he started to tell me why he hated the Bible so much. I was prepared to turn up that morning with black eyes to church and still preach. Did it rattle me? Absolutely. It rattled me. I wasn't prepared for that. But I should be prepared in one sense. Blessed are those who are persecuted because they're standing up for me. They're living in a world that doesn't accept Jesus. You see, here's the thing. Let me land with this, guys, and then we're going to pray. The thing is that when Jesus speaks this sermon, he starts it off with some seriously uh, hard things to understand. He's actually aiming straight at the heart for every one of us. Straight at the heart. No words were missed. Every single word was meant by Jesus. Every word was meant to hit the heart. He wants you and I. He wants you and I, those who have chosen to follow Jesus, 
to see that we're sinners in need of a saviour, to see that we're called to carry this meek, power under control heart, to have this hunger and thirsting after God, to be peacemakers, to be pure in heart, to be merciful to those around us. He wants us to sit in that space and say it's all okay. In fact, if you're getting peppered in this world, there's a good chance you're standing up for the things that I've called you to stand up for. To bring justice to a world of injustice.